Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Last Friday on January 26th, the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, in The Hague reached its decision regarding South Africa's charges against the State of Israel with its most outrageous accusation, blaming Israel for not less than the genocide of the people in Gaza after the events of October 7th. Two weeks prior to the decision, South Africa initiated a legal proceeding against Israel, claiming that Israel violated its obligations under the Geno Genocide Convention. Nothing, of course, could be further than the truth. But then again, we live at a time in which truth is being undermined, questioned, and disregarded. At a time like this, facts seem to not matter. Testimonies are only rumors, and even footages of mutilated bodies of Jewish men, women, and children in Israeli villages as a result of the barbaric attack of Hamas terrorists in, are merely graphics of camera. It seems that truth and facts have never been so much under attack as today. Even though the court did, did not rule the absolute ceasefire order, its ruling did provide support for other international calls for trade sanctions and armed boycotts against Israel. What can be said about the ICJ's decision regarding Israel last Friday and its war and about Israel and its war against Hamas? And what exactly were the provisional measures against Israel that were ordered? And what is their meaning and effect regarding the continuation of the war between Israel and Hamas? What can be expected in the following months? I'm a decanto, and to provide those uh, some clarity in this very complicated topic, I would like to introduce two experts in the field with whom I, am, I have the privilege uh, to discuss today. Mr. Arthur Lenk, who was Israel's ambassador to South Africa from um, 2013 to 2017, and who also served as ambassador to Azerbaijan and as director of the Department of International Law at Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and also Colonel Reserve Advocate Plina Shervik Baruch, Senior Researcher at INSS, Head of the Program on Law and National Security in the Institute, who served in the International Law Department of the Military Advocate General Unit for 20 years. A warm welcome to the both of you, Plina and Arthur, and thank you very much for joining me in this very, very important discussion today. To dive into the subject, I, I would like to um, present a question, the same question for the both of you. Relating last Friday, the decision of the ICJ, and then we will go and discuss more of the background and about South Africa and its relations to Israel uh, prior to the event. So what was your initial, both of you, your initial um, reaction to the court's decision? And what were your prior ex expectations uh, to, uh, before that? And did, it, did they meet reality? Did what you, th what you thought before, uh, beforehand really meet what actually happened? I would like to give Arthur the stage and then Plina, please. Yeah, I, I, I think it. Uh, lots of people in Israel came out with a reaction of it could have been worse. That uh, on the one hand, and I think that this is something that needs to be talked about a bit more, the court clearly accepted a South African narrative. It accepted that there's something to talk about here. And South Africa saw that as a big win. But I think that also us from Israel, who have huge problems with having to be in the court at all, understood that it could have been worse. The court could have put 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 much stronger terms and much stronger conditions on Israel. And I think that there is a realization that for in the short term, Israel is able to do what we need to do to act in self-defense and to uh, continue fighting against Hamas. To continue the war. Um, and if I would ask you this question on Thursday, what did you think? Think would happen? Did, did it really meet what you thought in the end? Well, uh, it was. I think that it, that it was a realistic conclusion. But the last time that Israel was in that building, in The Hague, in 2004, um, regarding the security barrier, Israel was uh, Israel didn't appear. Uh, or uh, Israel decided to boycott that event, and the court came out with a 14 to one decision against Israel. Um, it didn't change history. Israel still obviously has a security barrier in the West Bank and uh, along the border with Gaza. But uh, I think that, that there was an important change this time in that Israel decided to take part and tell our story. And I think that lots of people heard it. Yeah. Thank you, Arthur. Pnina, what was your reaction on Friday? Um, 
I was frustrated, although I did expect it. I mean, we'll combine the two parts of the question. I did, I did expect uh, uh, this kind of uh, decision. It was uh, estimated that the court will indeed initially preliminary. Uh, this is a preliminary stage, an interim uh, stage that it will in, uh, uh, give these uh, uh, orders uh, because it doesn't have to decide at this stage that, uh, that uh, it even has a suspicion that genocide is indeed being, uh, um, uh, that Israel is indeed uh, uh, causing a genocide or intending uh, to cause uh, any kind of genocide. So it is really a very, um, a very low threshold and uh, the estimate was that it would initiate some kind of orders and the estimate also was that it won't issue an order as South Africa asked to, uh, to Israel to cease fire the fight, to a ceasefire, a uh, unilateral ceasefire also because Hamas isn't there. Uh, but that it will be something more general along, along the lines that actually it did uh, eventually uh, provide uh, of uh, indeed saying to Israel, you have to respect your commitments under the Genocide Convention and some kind of enable more uh, humanitarian assistance. This was more or less what was, uh, what was uh, expected. I still was, was a bit disappointed because I think in the reasoning of the, of the judges, and it was, was a, 15, two, 15 judges and two, against two or even 16 against one in some of the, of the interim uh, orders, um, I, I thought that they completely disregarded the, the fact that Israel is fighting an ongoing war. Uh, this is not uh, just uh, the reference to Hamas was only in the initial, just mentioning the 7th of October events as the background. But everything then was like a unilateral, uh, uh, Israel is acting unilaterally in the Gaza Strip and uh, killing uh, 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 Palestinians and causing uh, uh, devastation, uh, um, structural devastation without even mentioning that this is a, 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 an armed, a, a, a war zone where it is fighting a very fierce enemy. And I was disappointed that this was disregarded, although it was raised by the representatives of Israel that appeared before the court. Mm -hmm. Let's 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 try and uh, talk just um, shortly about what indeed was decided. So, if I understood correctly, Israel is not accused, as South Africa, Africa would like, um, accused uh, to commit genocide in in, the, in Gaza. But there are preliminary orders. So, what are these preliminary orders? What are their, their effect? Maybe you can clarify a bit of the. A bit of the fog around this issue because I, I am sure that the you know, people who are not coming from legal um, fields, I, I don't know how much they understand really what is the effect of these uh, preliminary orders. What is their meaning? Continue regarding tomorrow morning on on the war between Israel and Hamas. So as I said, these are preliminary provisional measures. Um, mm -hmm. So first of all, they are temporary until there is a decision uh, mm. at, uh, on the main on the merits of the case. Um, and as I also said, and the, and the court really emphasized, and it is important to emphasize again, the court said we are not saying that Israel is committing genocide. It is not necessary, that we don't have enough facts, and we are not dealing, that's, that's for the merit stage. This is just um, uh, our understanding that, be, that there is a need to give some provisional measures uh, in order to uh, prevent potential uh, 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 rights that are protected by the Gen Gen uh, Genocide Convention from being infringed. And it is an urgent need because the situation is still ongoing. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what it says with regard to the genocide uh, accusation. And in essence, as I said, practically, they didn't, make, they didn't give any order that, that requires Israel to change something that it is doing, because the main order mean, it says that Israel must uh, um, follow its uh, uh, um, obligations uh, uh, or fulfill its obligations under the uh, Genocide Convention, uh, prevent which any is actually, uh, harm. Uh, uh, yes, which means that you're not obvious. to uh, try yeah, to yeah. kill, injure or cause destruction with an aim of destroying a group as such. So since Israel mm. is not doing that, so it can continue doing what it is, what it's doing and it's not and it's still fulfilling its obligations under the convention. Um, there's also a, an, a, an order with regard to take all measures to prevent incitement um, to commit genocide, which again Israel is doing, maybe it can do more, maybe now uh, there will be a little bit more 
sensitivity in Israel also to, to um, different uh, kinds of uh, speech that could be somehow yeah. uh, perceived we as will reach uh, it. Yeah, for the genocide. statements of politicians in Israel that yeah. can be very problematic internationally. Yes, yeah. but uh, also this could also be of the wider public and um, and maybe something that's a little bit more practical is to take immediate uh, and effective measures to enable the provision of humanitarian uh, basic services that again Israel is already doing so maybe there will be um, a more pressure, especially with regard to the transparency of it, because one of the mm -hmm. things that Israel needs to do is to provide now every month a monthly report to the ICJ, to the court, about uh, its fulfillment of these uh, provisional measures. So, uh, so it will have to explain what it is doing on the humanitarian uh, front, but, but it is already doing that too. So again, practically, it doesn't make much of a difference. I think it's more the fact that there is such a case, and maybe we will address this in a moment, is in itself something that I think is a very problematic for Israel. Of course, we will, we're just about to, to address this. Thank you, Penina. Arthur, um, I would like to ask your opinion regarding, from a diplomatic point of view, if the damage has not been done, because it's true that the decision was that Israel is not committing a genocide, but Alone, the fact that in one sentence Israel and genocide was somehow work somehow combined, I think caused Israel a massive damage, massive international damage. So maybe you, as as a former diplomat, you can enlighten us on 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 the image of Israel after uh, last Friday. What does it do to our international relations? And maybe we'll start now with South Africa. You want to address um, what is happening internally in, in South Africa at the moment after the decision and what's how, what were their reaction? I'm not sure that the, that Israel's image um, it was better afterwards. This is true. This, this no, well, first I think saying. you're right. First, I think I think you're right. I think that it's opening a new challenge for Israel. We it, it, it while, while the court didn't determine that Israel hasn't committed genocide, it certainly, or, or, or whether it has. It, mm -hmm. It's only a few weeks have gone by since this case has opened. In fact, there was a case in, that was opened in 1999 by Croatia against Serbia that took 16 years until it was finally completed. It's a huge, long process. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a process between Ukraine and Russia that started in 2022 that's still far away from any resolution whatsoever. So it's going to be, be some time, though, that Israel is in the same category with the Russias and Myanmar's and Serbia's in the world. So that's a big loss. That's a big problem for us. Even if we are, it's good that the court opened by talking about Hamas and how that started the event. And it concluded with a call to release hostages. Those are good things. Yeah. And it was important that, uh, that, that, that Aaron Barak wrote a separate opinion that's certainly worth reading in its original because it was it was beautiful and meaningful and a, a correct view of Israel. But um, the frequent fire mileage... I think this is the right place to, to mention the fact that Aaron, Judge Aaron Barak is also a Holocaust survivor and the place that he writes from, I think, comes from also um, his, his own experience in the Holocaust and this outrageous accusation of Israel committing genocide um, I think um, th there couldn't be a better person to uh, to defend Israel than Aaron Barak in this particular case, being a Holocaust survivor and knowing exactly what genocide means. And I, and I think it was good, again, different than in 2003, 2004, or in other cases, we were in the room and Israel's story mm -hmm. was told by the Malcolm Shaws and Tal Beckers of the world and the people mm -hmm. were able to hear. But at mm -hmm. the same time, and if you were really listening carefully to what the American president of this court read out, the court bought the South African narrative and South Africa celebrated. Its president went on television. National television gave a speech on Friday night talking about it was a victory for international law, for human rights, and above all, for justice. He tried to place, and South Africa sees itself almost in a romantic way that it saw itself in the 90s when it broke away from apartheid in a mostly nonviolent way and became a democracy. And uh, if we want to be cynical a little bit, South Africa hasn't been that way in recent years. The corruption, the crime, the cynicism of its international affairs in supporting Russia against Ukraine, suddenly South Africa has a winner from its own perspective. It sided with the global South against the big, rich Europeans and Americans and their allies. 
it took a stance that it sees as romantic, as for justice. And so uh, there's the South African media and uh, certainly friends of the Palestinians have been applauding the South Africans both before Friday and even more after seeing it as a win for their narrative. And that, as Pamina said correctly, every month we're going to have to write a document and watch ourselves what we do going forward. And uh, even if we're doing those things, and even if we believe that Israel doesn't incite to genocide, and it's obscene that we're being called that uh, for years to come, we're going to be having to deal with this. Um, almost unbelievable, the situation that we're in. Um, further to my question, I'd like to ask you, so how, how do you explain it? As a former ambassador in South Africa, you know the South African society, you know them from from close. What is the reason? How can, how can one explain the fact that they completely disregarded the massacre of Jews on October 7th in, in their uh, uh, speech prior to the two weeks prior to the decision? And um, what does it say about Israel-South African relations? Maybe we can have a bit of a, very shortly, a bit of a historical overview about the relations between Israel and South Africa. How have we reached the situation in which we are? With okay. them. Well, firstly, thanks, Adi, for the opportunity to, to, to give, do an advertisement. I just recently wrote an article for INSS about that topic. About and, and the reason I wrote it was people kept asking me, what does South Africa have against us? Why is South Africa jumping in to the Israel-Palestinian conflict? And the answer is, historically, South Africa, certainly, certainly the ruling party in South Africa, the ANC, the African mm -hmm. National Congress, sees itself in a identifies ideologically with the Palestinians. In the time of apartheid in South Africa, during the 1970s and 1980s, the ANC was illegal in South Africa, was seen as a terrorist organization in much of the world. And its allies were people who stood up against the white South African rule. Countries like the Soviet Union, like China, like, uh, like uh, Cuba, and, all, and other liberation organizations, like, for example, the PLO. And so when the transformation in South Africa came, um, and Mandela became president 30 years ago, he immediately renewed that friendship and continued, invited Arafat, along with the Israeli president, Mr. Weizmann, uh, Ezra Weizmann, to his inauguration uh, mm -hmm. 30 years ago. And... South Africa recognized Palestine as an independent state, and in more recent years has even strengthened that and pulled away from any bilateral relationship with Israel. Um, in my four years in South Africa, the foreign minister of South Africa wouldn't meet with me even once. The South African government didn't want to be seen as cooperating with Israel. It's basically made a decision not to be a broker, not to try to help peace, but to side with the Palestinians. You uh, you say the Palestinians, and in your article, which I read, and I really recommend our viewers to read it because it's it's uh, really it, it gives all the information needed uh, for the reader in these times uh, regarding the the, you know, the ICJ and the decision. And um, you write about Hamas, the relations between Hamas and South Africa, and I I do make a distinction here between Hamas and Palestinians. It's 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 a, it's a different entity. We're talking there's, about an or no terrorist that... organization. Um, ruling the Palestinian, uh, ruling Gaza at the moment. So um, what, is, what is South Africa's relation with Hamas? Well, um, well, in 2016, and then again in November, delegations from Hamas came and visited South Africa, were welcomed by the ANC. Mm -hmm. um, two weeks after October 7th, South Africa's foreign minister, who was in the courtroom last Friday, mm -hmm. had a phone call with Ismail Haniya. And, and, and Hamas put out a press statement thanking South Africa for its congratulations and good wishes. And they're immediately close South, allies. Well, I don't know that they're quote, close allies, but South Africa's picked a side. There's no question mm -hmm. about that. And South Africa sees itself as standing for the Palestinians, although it, it must be noted that in the, in the South African document, there is a condemnation of Hamas. One paragraph on... Uh, over 80 pages or so, mm -hmm. but um, there's no question. South Africa has picked a side and sees it as a winner for them domestically and internationally. Mm -hmm. 
about. Nina, you wanted to react, please. Yeah, I, I think what is important, and, and your, your emphasis on the difference between Palestinians and Hamas, uh, I think it's, it's very important uh, because we also have to, have to understand that, that uh, South Africa took a side, yes, on the side of Hamas, on the side of uh, armed resistance, but also on the side of the claim that Israel, that the occupation, when they, they have a paragraph that is, talks about the history and the context, and the context is not the occupation of 1967, the 56 years of the occupation, the occupation of 75 years of occupation that started in 1948. So they picked a side with those that claim that Israel has no right to exist. The existence of Israel is at stake. It's, uh, the whole of Israel is occupied land, Palestinian occupied land, not only the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Um, and here there's a difference between the Hamas and Palestinians, because Palestinians, at least some of them, are ready. And when we, uh, the, the PLO, for example, did make the, 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 at least took this step in 1993 to acknowledge the right uh, that Israel, the right of Israel to exist, to talk about the 1967 borders. Um, and I think uh, what we see here uh, is South Africa playing an active role in an international campaign, and we saw one of the one of the speakers was John Duggar. John Duggar uh, for South Africa. John Duggar, uh, was a, who's South African, was the um, human right uh, in the UN. He was the, the human rights rapporteur on the uh, rights of the Palestinians in the occupied Palestinian territories. He's very anti-Israel, and his idea is for years to delegitimize Israel completely, Israel's existence, Israel's right to exist. Uh, he was campaigning for this, uh, trying to portray Israel as an apartheid state, an apartheid state in all parts, including the way it treats the Israeli Arabs, that they, the citizens and Arabs that have full rights, yes, equal rights. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, that's not how uh, Dugard presents it. Um, and South Africa went into this uh, a campaign of uh, portraying Israel as an apartheid state. This is already for several years. And now it went an additional mile of saying Israel as a genocidal state that is carrying out genocide. So we have to understand that you are right. It, this is the Hamas and a, 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 a ideas. Uh, and then of those, uh, I would also say Iran and the, uh, uh, that also has uh, ties with uh, South Africa and the, this uh, axis that are that aim to destroy the state of Israel. The idea is that there is two folds, two layers of destruction. The one is what Hamas is doing on the ground. And here again, it's not just the 7th of October. It's everything that has, has happened since then. Uh, also in the Gaza Strip, also in the other fronts, Hezbollah, the Houthis, all other Iranian proxies. Uh, the idea is, here is to destroy Israel physically, eventually to lead to its distru physical destruction. And the second layer is this international campaign that is aimed at the destruction of the idea of Israel, of its right to exist on the international plane. And the connection is that by portraying Israel as this country that is carrying out a genocide, then um, there will be pressure on all its allies, on, on companies, on anyone not to assist Israel in its military campaign. So there is a connection also, direct connection between the two. Clear, clear. And I really want to take it from this point now, you know, that was very important and ask you, until now we talked only about South Africa, but it's clearly the the, the problem is a lot bigger. I, I like, let's change a bit the lens and uh, switch it to a bigger lens now. You're referring, Pnina, um, in your speeches, in your articles to a war. There's a war against Israel internationally. Uh, it's not new. Uh, this war has been going on for for years. Um, you just mentioned it. But since the 7th of October, there definitely was a changing point in which it was a lot more extreme. There's a war um, happening against Israel in the international media, in the social media, um, in Congress, in, on the streets, on demonstrations. Israel is a war not only against Gaza, but actually there's, a, a, there's another uh, front uh, that is the, the international front. And you referred also in, in your speeches to, to the fact that it managed to include all Palestinians under a group of the oppressed. This is, I'm trying to think about, maybe you can elaborate on it. On what, who are the main actors in this war? And how are they, what is the image of the Palestinians? What, what is the image of, of, um, of Israel, of the oppressed and the, uh, the, the, the ones who are, yeah, the Goliath, yeah, and the oppressed, uh, tying Israel to alleged crimes against humanity. So 
who are the main actors and how, what can Israel do? Can Israel do something in this war? Is it, how, what is Israel's place, role even in this, in something that is maybe a lot bigger than what we can handle? Uh, Nina. So I think, Nina and then um, Arthur. And then Arthur. Okay. So I think one a very important actor, and we saw its significance, by the way, in the decision of the ICJ is the United Nations. And mainly within the United Nations structure is the, or the human rights apparatus of the, of the uh, United Nations. And we saw that the judge actually that was there, when, when she read the head of the, the, the president of the court, when she had read the, the decision, um, she was quoting again and again, UN representatives, the, um, the uh, Guterres, yes, the uh, General Secretary, but Secretary General, but also the um, head of uh, the General Manager of UNRWA, which now we know UNRWA is a very problematic body. Every day we see more and more and hear of more and more ties between UNRWA and the Hamas. And UNRWA also, in, more generally, is, is part of the problem. It's not part of the solution. It's part of the problem of solving, of finding a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict because of this idea, I said again before, the 1948 idea, the right of return means that everybody will, all the Palestinians and their descendants will come back to their houses in Israel and throw out the Jews that are sitting, that are sitting there. That's the idea of the destruction of the state of Israel and its right to exist. So quoting UNRWA, quoting the general secretary, quoting uh, another uh, representative uh, of humanitarian issues in the UN. And those were the, those were the viewed by the court, and that's the problem, as objective actors. And if they say something, that's the fact. And what we know is that the UN is not an objective, neutral actor. It has an agenda. It has a pro-Palestinian, an anti-Israel agenda. We see it. I've been covering and reading all the declarations made by the rapporteurs, the different rapporteurs on human rights, on different aspects of human rights from the beginning, from the 7th of October. And they are all one-sided, barely mentioning the 7th of October. In some cases, make, mixing up what happened there. For example, one with regard to children was talking about what is Israel is doing to the children in Gaza and the killing, maiming, and holding hostage which meant it looked as if Israel was holding children hostages. This was still in the, the beginning of November when the Israeli children were still, most of them were still held hostage. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the end of October. So um, we have a big problem. So that's, and then the NG, and all the UN, NG, the human rights NGOs, uh, these are all a very powerful actors and they have a very, very anti-Israel and very non-objective a way of evaluating the conflict. Again, the conflict, as you said, and I end with this, is the strong Israel against the poor Palestinian people without even acknowledging that there is a very powerful enemy there. The Hamas has been preparing for this war for 16 years, entrenched with very powerful uh, 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 military uh, assets and capabilities that we saw on the 7th of October. We are there for almost four months and we are still fighting. They still are holding strong. We have our soldiers killed every day. Uh, this is an active war and it is portrayed as if it's Israel, the strong Israel, just killing Palestinians because it can. Arthur, do we, does Israel have any chance of somehow combating this, this situation? I mean, uh, diplomatically, what is, what are the tools that Israel has as a state to fight this? Of course we have tools, and of course we have opportunities. And really, even beyond the, here's, here, here's some good news. Sure, the UN is not our friend in many organizations, right? We're, certainly on the issue of women, the pressure that got put on the United Nations correctly to force them to recognize what happened to Israeli women on October 7th was an important and worthwhile campaign and uh, will continue. But at the same time, Israel has lots of allies and lots of friends around the world, right? We've heard from Germany and the UK and Australia and uh, many other countries around the world who understand that uh, if they were in the situation with Israel, that Israel was in, they would probably act in a not dissimilar way. But I think that if that's the case, and if there's um, an, a group of countries maybe starting with the BRICS countries, right? Right, from, uh, from Russia and China 
and South Africa that look for some chaos and look to fight against a rules-based society, against, I don't know if we call it a NATO northern pro-American grouping. I think the opportunity here is we need to be in that second group and really be there. And for our leaders to be making decisions that bring us closer to those allies. And if that and means- I, Allow me just to care. interfere just for a second. How can we be there? And well, at the same time, time we have politicians, um, ministers sitting in the government who call for, you know, I know that Tina also wants to react to this, from the right, okay, from the right wing, who are calling for um, un, un, unheard of actions in Gaza by Israel, I mean, things that for sure Israel will not do, but they say it, they say very problematic statements. Well, so how well, can we aspire to, to, to include ourselves in this group of democratic Western nations while we do have also other politicians inside Israel calling for something totally else, totally different. Well, if we don't act like a responsible country, if we don't act like a country that international law and human rights are important to us, then we're going to get treated like a country, like a, like a Russia or like a Myanmar. But if we want to be treated the way America would want to be treated, or the way the UK, or we want people in Europe or in Asia to identify us, we have to behave in that kind of way. We have to make plans for the day after. We have to understand that the Palestinians are our neighbors and that we have to have a, an idea, a direction, a plan. Right now, our government is not making plans, not making choices. And we have extreme elements who you say easily, they, they are saying things and Israel won't do it. Well, we need to be sure that Israel doesn't do those things. Because if, because, well, but, but that's exactly it. So it's not just dependent on the rapporteurs in the United Nations. It's not just dependent on the General Assembly. It's dependent on us. We have the power to choose whether we want to be a liberal Western democracy that honors human rights. And I choose that. But I think that our leaders need to make that choice and make it clear that to the Biden administration, to the European Union, to our friends who are equally distressed at what's happening in UNRWA. And it was good to see so many countries announce immediately that they understand that uh, UNRWA is a big part of the problem and unless they change it. But at the same time, if we don't find an alternative to UNRWA, if we don't come up with an idea how Palestinians can live their lives in Gaza and in the West Bank in a reasonable way, then it's all gonna fall on us. Clear. Thank you very much, Arthur. Pnina, your final words, and also a bit of your vision of how what's going to happen in the next following months concerning Israel and its international fight for for a positive image. How do you what what will happen? With regard to your question, and also to continue what Arthur said, I think uh, we have to understand, as I said before, we are fighting a campaign that is a campaign to delegitimize the state of Israel, but. So there are those that it doesn't matter what Israel will do, <laughs> they are against Israel, they don't want to see us exist. But what is more important is really the group of people, uh, countries, uh, persons in the part of the public that don't have a, 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 an anti-Israel approach. Um, and those are the audience that we have to, and the supporters of Israel that support Israel but also have liberal ideas. And those audiences we have to, we have to engage with. And here it is so important what we do and what we say. And I agree that Israel, uh, that there is an importance to what we do, there is an importance to what our leaders say, what our public says, and we also have to acknowledge that, that, that Israel has managed to uh, become um, viewed as the obstacle for peace. Now, we know that the Palestinians are also a major, a major obstacle for peace, exactly for what I said before, the idea of the right of return, for example, UNRWA. Um, uh, but for the international uh, community, Israel is perceived as the one saying no to peace. And I think Israel has to acknowledge that the Palestinians are here. It is in our interest to find to a peaceful resolution of the conflict. Maybe it's difficult. Maybe it won't be possible because of, so it, because of the Palestinians. But it shouldn't be impossible because of Israeli's approach. And I think exactly. Israel has to be more proactive, talk, talk about trying to solve the, the conflict, talk about the day after in the Gaza, I agree, otherwise it will be on us. Um, and these things could, ha could help 
they could help in the, the international campaign uh, generally, but also even specifically in this case, because eventually we will have the decision. A decision in this uh, case that says that Israel is carrying out genocide will be devastating for Israel. I don't believe it will happen because really the law is on our side. I mean, I really think it's a very difficult uh, conclusion to get to that Israel has a genocidal intent. Yeah, law but, on the one hand and image on yes, the other. Yes, but we yeah. know that there's politics there and we know that the, the judges are very, also as I said, they look at what the UN says, what the media says, what academia says, and so it is very important uh, uh, that Israel uh, 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 takes a, 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 an, an active, positive role in this regard, and I think that could also impact eventually also the decision in this case beyond, as I said, the, the wider uh, campaign, the diplomatic campaign that Israel is facing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Panina. And not stand alone. If there's something that I can also take from what both of you uh, said, uh, not good to stand alone. Always look for partners. Always look for allies. It's always a good, uh, a good hint, a good tip. Arthur Lang, Ambassador Arthur Lang, and Pina Shalvit Baruch, thank you very, very much for enlightening us on these legal issues. Which uh, it's it's clear that it's not only legal. Uh, we're dealing with image. We're dealing with truth, facts, and and. The uh, we are in problem with facts uh, nowadays, and um, I think this talk um, definitely enlightened the, the more positive side of, um, of looking at truth and facts, and this is what really matters. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, and thank you for our viewers, and see you in the next show.